So uh, we're, very, we're delighted to have um, uh, Doug Harrison with us, who's very kindly driven all the way down from Gabriola Island to uh, speak with us today, or this evening. Um, Doug has had a long history in the forestry industry, uh, training as a uh, forest engineer at UBC, and then working with uh, uh, Macmillan Bloedel for many years, was involved in many very big fires, and was a fire boss, in fact, on a, on a, on a number of those occasions. And uh, when I, uh, I, in my 43 years of flying, I never once flew uh, a water bomber or a fire bomber. I have nothing, I don't know anything about it. So I'm looking very much forward to uh, Doug's, uh, basically his memories of all those years uh, with Mac Blow and whoever else you work for. So Doug, thank you for coming down and thank you all for showing up tonight. Uh, over to you, Doug. Okay, everybody can hear me. Well, you probably won't want to listen after a few minutes. but. <laughs> I did this presentation nine years ago and did it all over the place on Vancouver Island, except Victoria. Martin Mars, fire engine of the VC Coast. Last night, I was sitting there and I thought we might have a repeat performance of October the 14th, 1962 when the Mars flew right across Bat Bay Airport all on its own. But, but I understand it's still out there. Well, that's good. So, what I'm going to attempt to do here is put these pictures up on the screen and advance them if I can. This is one of my favorite pictures of the Mars. It was taken by a friend of mine, a helicopter pilot for Forest Industries Flying Tankers, a guy by the name of Cliff Swin. Uh, that picture is the Mars sitting on Sprode Lake, taken from the helicopter. I took this one I, I forget exactly what fire that was, or what was a demo, or what it was, but anyways, we'll, we'll carry on. I'm not a pilot, and I know very little about the day-to-day -day operation of, of the Martin Mars. I was what you would call a customer. And what a customer was, was some poor guy that was in a very desperate situation. And he was looking at it from down there, or he's looking up at it from there. So that is the end of the Mars that I'm most familiar with. Anyways, as a customer, we all always wonder if we're getting our bang for the buck. And so we look into statistics. And I was involved with the Mars right off from the beginning. And, and I look back at some, some uh, statistics, and it was a long time ago when I was there. So I, I just got the numbers up until 1986. And, FIFT company at that time put out some numbers. At that time, the Mars had operated on 373 major fires on the BC coast. It had made 6,700 drops. You know something? You look at that, and you look back, I think nothing happened. The Mars was called out. We put the fires out and we went back logging. And after a while, nothing happened. That is true, except for a couple of fires that 
for some reason, I got involved with. <laughs> and at the end of the program tonight, I'll tell you a little bit about those fires. But to start with, what I'd like to do is talk about a little bit about the history of the Mars, where it all got started, and why. I've got a, I've got a little map here that'll help me out on this. Do you want me to hold it up for you there, bit? Yeah, maybe you can hold it up. I'll advance this thing. Oh, there's the map. You can see it. And, oh, there's a little pointer here, too. <laughs> okay. What this is all about was 66 years ago. I was just a teenage boy at the time. Just about 16. The place was Great Central Lake. Anybody know where Great Central Lake is? Well, there was a company town at that time. It was 1958. Company town was called Great Central. And what it was, it was the headquarters for the Mac Macmillan Bloedel Logging Operations Road Lake Division. The office was right there. I'm shaking as hell. <laughs> the, the town site was right here and there was about 400 inmates living there <laughs> my house was that one I can't, I'm so shaky I can't get it, but it's right there one of the red ones? yeah, the red one the maintenance shop for Great, Great Central Lake or, or Sproul Lake was here and this was called Boot Lagoon. Great Central Lake went up there for 27 miles. Anyways, as a teenager, uh, 19, 1958 was right at the height of the Cold War. And Great Central was right on the flat, the flight class of U.S. Uh, military aircraft flying from Seattle to Anchorage, Alaska. They were building the Dew Line. And because of that, at Great Central, we, the, we had a, an RCAF Ground Observer Corps. There it is. That's the book for it. I still got it. And what, what this Ground Observer Corps was all about was that some of the teenage boys and a lot of the housewives in the camp would, would be involved in reporting aircraft flying over. And what we did, if we saw an aircraft flying over, we'd run home, get the telephone, and it was one of these. <laughs> We would ring up to the Sea Island Airport, YVR now, and report. Aircraft flash, Digby 2, Port Alberni 47Y, and then we would report C-124 flying 270 degrees, 18,000 feet. It's hard to believe now with all this state of the art communications we have now, but that's what we did. So, us teenage boys, we knew our aircraft. We could tell a C-124 or a B-36 at 20,000 feet. Anyways, same time, 1958, Macmillan Bloedel had only one corporate aircraft. There she is. The Grumman Goose. And we called it the Dryad. Lord knows why it was called the Dryad. That's what it was called. It would fly in to Great Central 
on quite a regular basis, bringing in these customers and important people, whoever they were, to view the logging operation or for meetings or whatever. The pilot of that aircraft was a guy called Dan McIver. There he is, he's sitting in the goose. Now what would happen, he would, he would fly in and he would, he would dock, where is this, he would dock right at that dock right there and then he would just sit with the aircraft, smoke cigarettes while his passengers went off to do whatever they were doing and he would be sitting around there for several hours at a time but of course as teenage boys we we found out about him and he was he was quite an engaging type of a guy and I would say like he was a born salesman he was really full of BS <laughs> <laughs> anyways we would go down there to the goose and he would give my brother cigarettes and let me sit in the plane and show me how everything worked. You know, I'd be inside there. So anyways, we got to know him pretty well. The one feature about Dan McIver that was quite unusual for a pilot at the time is that he wore glasses. And the lenses on his glasses were as thick as a Coke bottle. Like, in fact, when he looked at it, his eyes like. <laughs> so anyways, but but that was one of his the things that you know. So, so anyways, we got to know him. At the same time, and this was early in the spring of 1958. A couple of old loggers that were friends of my dad's. They got Dan McIver all steamed up about bombing fires. And they got this idea that uh, what you could do was have these paper bags full of water. And somehow they, they got some of these bags. They were five gallons each, round paper bag. And they did this trial out in the Ash River Valley was out that way, out there someplace. And the the two guys' names were one was his name was Chauncey Jorgensen, and he was the fire warden and the equipment supervisor. The other guy was Alan West and he was the woods foreman. They were both haywire old railroad bosses. <laughs> so anyways they rode in the back. Dan McIver dived, they had a fire out in a place by the Ash River Pit. And he would dive on the fire and they would fire up the bags up <laughs> the back. So they did it with what I heard, they did it twice. Five bags a time. And they actually hit the fire once. <laughs> but I wasn't there to see that, but it was the talk of the town. Like it was really going around about how crazy these guys were. Now, I did some research back and I actually found an article in the local paper about this. And it appeared the way the article was written that this was a scientific experiment. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, time went on. The summer of 1958 was really, really hot. And in August, the camp was already down with extreme weather for almost two weeks. And this one morning, it was a Sunday morning, I got up from in our house, looked up Great Central Lake, right from our house right there, I looked up the lake, and there was this giant fire. The, the, the smoke was going right up into the stratosphere. This was a huge fire up there. 
So it was about 10 in the morning and about 5 after 10, this Alan West looked for and he ended up at my dad's door and, and he's, he was all excited. That there was a big landing barge on Great Central Lake that belonged to, to a joint thing of uh, the BC Forest Service and BC Hydro. They own this. But some bureaucrat from the BC Forest Service decided right in the middle of, of summer to take the engines out of this, this thing, you know, for maintenance reasons or something. So we had to put the engines back in this, this uh, landing barge. My dad and I helped him. I was a gopher. I was down in the bed, built doing that. Well, Alan West, the foreman, was up on deck putting a D8 cap and a logging truck with a slip-on tank on deck. And so we all left for the fire at about 6 o'clock at night that night. The next morning, right in front of our house, it looked like one of the major battle scenes of the Second World War, right in this area here. There must have been 30 crummies or buses and about 200 loggers all milling around there. And what they had right here in a place called the Ark Resort, there was, a war, there was four aircraft. And what they were doing, they were flying all these loggers to the head end of the lake. It was an 11 minute flight. It's the only way of getting there. And so they were going back and forth, back and forth with these loggers. All the loggers had to fight the fire at that time was a pick and, and a shovel and a thing called a Pulaski. Anybody know what a Pulaski is? Well, it, it was like, a, like an axe with a pick on it. That's what they had for fighting the fire. The second day of the fire, in the meantime, the fire was burning up two or three hundred acres crowning up into the rock plus and going on and on. Second day of the fire, my dad was sent up in the barge. They had got an access road to the base of the fire, but the fire was a thousand feet in elevation above them. They couldn't get water up there. It was hotter than hell. And so what they took, my dad took up, they had a thing called a bean pump. And what a bean pump was, it was like a giant power washer. It's a piston pump with a Ford V8 engine on it, and it would pump up to 2,000 PSI of pressure. And that's the only way of getting water to the top of the mountain. But to do this, they had to have aluminum pipe. And there was these, all these 20 foot lengths of aluminum pipe. And these loggers from Northwest Bay Division of Macmillan Bloedel Park, they were there and their job was to pack all these aluminum pipes up the mountain. It was a hell of a job. And my dad was at the bottom watching this. So this Chauncey Jorgensen and Alan West, they got a brainwave. What they would do, once they got the water up, we had to get other equipment up to the top, and they had to get some water to the loggers as well. So, so what they did, they decided they'd have an airdrop. But people now think, well, this is just plain crazy. But what they did, there was a meadow up on top, above the fire, up at 2,000 feet in elevation. They decided they would put all the stuff in the goose, fly up there and drop it. Just, uh, so what they had, they had a bunch of, of, of hose, and they had gasoline cans especially, and, and they had a bunch of blocks of ice. And the blocks of ice were in these paper bags. So they went ahead with this, recognizing that there was no radio communication at that time. 
the aircraft have radios, but the guys on the ground, there was no such thing as a portable radio in those days. So they were, so anyways, what happened? They dropped all this stuff, but what happened? There was a tragedy involved. One of these blocks of ice, or they think it was a block of ice, if nobody was ever sure. But one of the loggers from Northwest Bay got hit on the head with what they thought was a block of ice, and he died. So it was a tragedy, and that tragedy was really the initial point of the development of the marsh. That night, I could remember this. The sun was going down on Great Central Lake. The sun goes down right straight up the lake. All four aircraft were parked right at the Ark Resort float. There was a Grumman Goose. There was two Pacific Western Norseman aircraft. Anybody know what a Norseman is? Well, it, it's a rickety old bush plane, the loudest bloody thing that you can ever ride on. They're horrible things. But anyways, there was two of those, and there was one, here I'll, I've got some pictures of these devils. Oh, and the last one was a bright yellow Beechcraft D-17. It's called a Stagger Wing. You ever seen one of those? Any of you? Well, that's what it was. So there was the four aircraft. There's a Norseman. In fact, that probably was one of the ones that was there. So they were all sitting there. They'd, ha they'd have a... They'd had a... a an investigation already as to what happened with this accident. And after that, everybody was kind of sitting around licking their wounds. And the two Norseman pilots were starting to pump fuel. Somebody had rolled some barrels down of Avgas, so they were pumping fuel. So, here we were, myself and two of my friends, we were kind of lurking around in the shadows, just like flies on the walls, just listening for whatever was to be said. Eh? There was a bunch of guys there, and I'll name a few of them, that were sitting around talking about this. One of the guys, two of them were the managers of these logging camps. One guy, the manager of, of uh, Sprout Lake Division, was a guy by the name of Bill Lukes. The other was a guy by the name of Frank Garrison. He was the manager of Northwest Bay. I knew both of these guys pretty good because both of them had pretty young daughters that went to school with me, so, so I knew all about that. On top of that, Alan West, the wood forward, he was there, of course. Then Chauncey Jorgensen, he was there. And then there was the two pilots, Dan McIver, and the pilot of that yellow Staggerwind Beechcraft was a guy by the name of Jack Bowl. He was a chief pilot for Pacific Western Airlines. At that time, Pacific Western Airlines had a base on Sprout Lake. So these guys were sitting around t talking and uh, started a discussion that there's some things in life, like this was 66 years, some things in life you don't forget. Dan McIver started. He said, in the future we're going to use aircraft for fighting fire. And then he goes on, he says, well, L. West and Chauncey and I, we, we bombed the fire this spring. 
that all worked like a hot dump. <laughs> <laughs> Alan West, he piped up. He says, that was totally Mickey Mouse. <laughs> that Dan McIver, and he, he said, well, no, 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 he says, I didn't mean that, he says, Macmillan Bloedel is a paper company, and they have the ability to make big paper bags. <laughs> and, and he, he said, we could make a paper bag that holds 50 gallons, and it'll fit right into the Bombay of an existing World War II bomber. And on top of that, he said, I know right now that Crown has assets of two B-25 Mitchell bombers for sale. They can be had for nothing. Anybody know what a B-25 is? Okay. So, uh, at that point, Jack Bowl, he said, oh, no, no, no. He says, the way to do this is to use the flying boat. And, what do you mean, flying boat? And then Jack Bowl says, yeah. He said, we, Pacific Western, right now, we have one for sale. And they said, well, well what's that? There it is. <laughs> he said, we've got a strand rare, and it's for sale. And he said, it, he says, I know all about these. We work for Queen Charlotte Airlines. He says, those aircraft could fly standing still. <laughs> and in fact, if you get enough of a headwind, they'll fly backwards. <laughs> but that's about right. I, I did a painting of, of the sky where it was right there. There it is. There's a guy from the Charlottes here. His mother worked at Alifer Bay, and they were flying strand rares. Okay. So then they went on from them. And Dan McIver says, oh, no, 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 no. Flying boats are no good because they can only get off the water with half a load because of surface tension. And that's right, surface tension water, they can't break free. And at that point, Chauncey Jorgensen, this equipment supervisor, he was a guy that really thought out of the box. And he said, well, why don't you get the darn thing up, ready to take off, and then scoop up the water? Now, maybe some scientists have already figured that out. I don't know. But that was the first time a lawyer figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the start, really, the start of the Maya Mars idea. Right there. It came from him. I forgot, I forgot to mention too that Bill Loops, the manager from from, from uh, Great Central Scroll Lake Division, right at the start, he brought out a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and they were passing that around. And by the time all this was done, he also mentioned that whatever you do, it's got to be done on the cheap. Because you've never seen a bunch of skin flints like you, you can find at some senior management of Macmillan Bloedel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's got to be done for nothing. And so, so that's what we have. It had to be scooped out of the water, it had to be done for nothing. And away they went. So what happened after that discussion? Bottle of whiskey was empty. <laughs> Two or three days later it rained and the fire went out and everybody went home. But 
Dan McIver, he started to run with this flying boat idea. So we'll carry on here. Oh, there was mention of the council. That's a council flying boat. But at that time, they were way too expensive. They were amphibians, and every two-bit airline on the BC coast wanted them, so they commanded a higher price. So couldn't use one of those. So here we are, early in the spring of 1959. A couple of other haywire pilots called the Miko brothers. Anybody know who they were? They started the West Coast Air. Well, those guys started experimenting with the DC Forest Service, and they developed these two little 90 or, or 45 gallon tanks. And you, you can kind of see them here. And what they were, they were mounted on an axis on the floats of a beaver aircraft. And when you got over the, uh, you pulled this line, the thing spun around and they were open on top and it dumped the water on. So they were experimenting with that. And so what happened, Dan McIver, McMillan, Bloedel, they, they got hold of these tanks. They had ferry aviation here at, uh, at Pat Bay, installed them on the Grum and Goose. So that's, that's, that was the beaver experiment. There it is on the Grum and Goose. And I can remember that because they did a demo of that going back a little bit. Oh, there we are. Right, right there, there was a ball field at Great Central Lake. They put a smudge pot right on the pitcher, pitcher's mound and Dad McIver flew over to drop the water on that. He had to do it three times before he hit it, but he did. <laughs> and, and we, uh, and, and it sort of went on from there. But anyways, it was the summer of 1950, just shortly after that, that Dan found out about the Martin Mars. So, so there it is. These things were, were located El, at Almeda, California. At the time there was four of them left. And now I'm not, today I'm not going to get into all of that because you guys can see all that stuff on YouTube and on Facebook and all these places, all this story. Is, is there. And so I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time or, or you know, you're going to get very uncomfortable sitting there. So, but anyways, they found these things. Down went down with some guys from Ferry Aviation. They looked at them. They negotiated. There's a guy named Hugo Forrester. He was a scrap dealer and a bit of a con man and he was bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, he had bought all four of them for $23,000 and he sold them to, to Macmillan Bloedel for $100,000. So <laughs> that, there's all that story. But anyways, we'll get into that. In the fall of 1959, they got some U.S. Navy crews and flew them all up to Pat Bay here. Well, carry it. There they are again. That's the original Mars that actually first flew in 1942. A little bit different configuration. This is one of the big problems in developing the Mars. And when you read all about this aviation history, everything was great. 
But the, there was many, many, many problems. The bars first was developed in, like I say, in 1942, and eventually they sort of redeveloped it. It was going to be a transport for the invasion of Japan, but that doesn't work out. But anyway, there was some huge problems. At the same time, they were developing the B-29 bomber. B-29 had the same engines, right 3350, double row 18 cylinder uh, engines. These engines were a total problem. In fact, they deferred the development of the B-29 and the Mars for over a year and a half before they could get the bugs on them. So anyways, that's what happened. That's the Marianne, no, the Marshall Mars. That, that was one of the uh, engine problems. Well, well, carry on. There you are, the whole crew standing on the wing. Elvita. Okay. When, when you look at YouTube or on the internet, there's a couple of books here, really good reads too, about the development of the Mars. I don't know if you've ever seen this, Rain Coast Chronicles, No Numbered Highways by a pilot. They tell all about Dan McIver and everything that was done. Now, the one thing that I want to say, so everybody knows, and you don't get this in your, <coughs> this development was a team effort. A lot of these things make it look like it was a one-man show, but it was a team effort. And there was a couple of other guys that were totally instrumental in the development of the Mars. The first guy was a guy by the name of Duncan McFadden. And Duncan McFadden worked for Macmillan Bloedel. He was a senior accountant, a numbers man. And he knew is a way, his way around the politics of senior management of Macmillan Bloedel. Now this is a maze of unbelievable pr proportions. You have to be a true politician to, to navigate through this and get anybody to listen to. And it's all about money. He's the guy that got the money to buy the Mars. He's also, when I looked at, he was the guy who had connections with all the major forest companies at that time. And what you got to realize at that time, in the late 1950s, all the, there was a period of rapid expansion in the forest industry, and all the major companies were working to try to secure tenure, getting forest land. And what they were doing was they were working on a on something at that time called a forest management license. And to get a forest management license, you had to prove and provide fire protection. And so providing fire protection was a key to getting tenure. And, and so that's why there was a lot of interest in something like the Mars at the time. The second guy who was really important was a guy by the name of uh, Nils Christensen. Nils was the mechanical genius of the whole thing. He's went, he accompanied Dan McIver. He was working at the time for the Victoria Flying Club 
right here in Pack Bay. And he was also working for Ferry Aviation. He accompanied Dan McIver down to Almeida. He made the deal to get all the spare parts. And he, he was able to look at those aircraft and make sure that they actually were airworthy. Following that, Deals hired on as the maintenance guy for FIFT, Forest Industry Flying Tankers. And he was instrumental in setting up the infra infrastructure to make the Mars work. So, like I say, it was a team effort. So, we'll carry on here. I've totally lost where I'm down here, so I'm going to have to look at my notes and figure out what I'm going to talk about now. But, but uh, yeah, there's the, the first Mars. I think it's been taken out of the water at Pat Bay there. And what you can, you can't see it too good in this picture. But it was the ugliest old beast that you've ever seen in your life. It was ugly as sin. What they had done, they took all the U.S. Navy insignia off of it, and they sprayed it over with some old black or gray paint or something, just with a spray can. And this thing was, it looked god-awful. <laughs> so, so there it is. That's the first flight. I think it was about April or May of of 1960. That first plane, what they did, they made these plywood tanks on the flight deck of the aircraft. These 6,000 gallon tanks, they were made out of silver ply, Macmillan Vlodell plywood. <laughs> and what they did, they hired some poor suckers from some, they, these guys obviously are dead now. They had to go inside those tanks and fiberglass them. So anyways, that's what he did. There she is. That's right off Pat Bay. That's the first drop. Now, just a couple more pictures of the individual. Dan McIver, Nils Christensen. Here's the last guy. He was the last chief pilot that I work with anyways, but Bill Waddington. But Bill Waddington, he came along a little bit after about 1964 or so. This is a, a picture right off the start. There's a few guys, I could point out a couple of guys there. Whoop. There's Dan McCarty, Dills Christensen. A couple more guys that, unfortunately, but Wally Wiggins, pilot. Bud Richmond. I mentioned those guys because Wally Wiggins and Bud Richmond are the guys that crashed at the first Mars in 1961. Again, at Northwest Bay. Northwest Bay has it's it's not a good place for the Mars. <laughs> so anyway, what I wanted to mention at this point was that Great Central Lake, we'll go back to my map again here. Great Central Lake was selected as kind of the where is it? There it is. The trading ground, I guess, for the Mars when it first started. Spring, spring of 1960. I, I was still living in my house there, right there. But I could remember that dark Mars. It would come drifting in from the south, right over Boot Lagoon, right across our house. <laughs> maybe a hundred feet, hundred fifty, even less. <laughs> <laughs> come drifting across there, and right at our house, 
they would pitch up all the boulders and she'd start backfiring like crazy. <laughs> and it would hit the water right above there. And then they would widen on her 20 to 24 seconds to pick up another load. They'd go up the lake, turn around, come back and they'd drop it. There's rock bluffs all along here, timbered rock bluff. They'd come back and drop it on there. And what they did, it was interesting, like they were doing some really scientific experiments here, so uh, I'll go back again to where I was. So, yeah, they had this. This was a so-called bird dog plane. It was a Cessna 195. Beautiful little aircraft, the real upscale, bigger than the 180, big seven-cylinder Jacobs engine, real beauty. Somebody, I don't know, they begged, borrowed, or stole this engine from somebody <laughs> because they didn't have any money to do anything. But they had this. And when they'd fly ahead of the bars with that, and then they'd fly over the rock bluffs, and they first started an experiment, like I said, group science. What they did to start with is they threw toilet paper out onto the top of the timber. And the idea being, if they hit the toilet paper, it would dissolve, and they knew they hit. Well, that, that didn't work very much. There was toilet paper all over the place. <laughs> and so then, so, so then what they did, they got this red dye, fluorescent red dye, and, and it was powdered stuff. And so they threw that out. And so pretty well, after a while, all the timber around there was red. And that, well, I, I, I don't know if they ever hit anything, but they were dropping a lot of water. And we, young kids, we had speedboats at the time on the lake, and we would go out there and watch, try to stay out of the way. Bills Christensen at the same time was working on the infrastructure at, of the base at Sprout Lake. And I don't, I, well, this is some other stuff. There, there was an old sawmill at Sprout Lake. And they, they, <coughs> excuse me, they, they decided this was going to be the base. And so the total infrastructure in 1960, guess what they had? An anchor. <laughs> that was it. Then they got a fuel tank. By this time, I was at the start of university and I was working in the summer and stuff. And this John C. Jorgensen gave me a job. And one of the things we did, they, they needed a maintenance shop and they needed a lunchroom. So, so there was a couple of old bunkhouses at Great Central Shop. So we got a D8 cat and we dragged these two old bunkhouses all the way to Sprout Lake. It was about eight kilometers with a D8. There was hardly anything left of them by the time we got there. <laughs> well, that's their lunch room, and that's the maintenance shop. So that's what they have. So, uh, in 1965, a friend of mine got a job. George Edson, and he, he designed a new shop for them. Somebody, they got some money someplace. So we'll go back a little bit. That there is LYL. That's the beast that you got sitting out in the yard there. That one was a new idea. They get, didn't have the plywood tanks in it. They decided to use the fuel tanks in the hull for hauling water, and they dumped out of the bottom. You could see, see it dumping out of the water. I'll tell you a little story about that. This was early 1964, first flight, first demonstration. I was working in the summer at Sproat Lake Division, again at that ball field. Remember I told you about the ball field? Well, anyways, we had to set up a demo, and they had all these officials from McMill and Bloedel to, to watch this thing make its first dump. And, well, 
things went a little bit bad there. Like we <laughs> we had all these officials sitting around. Somebody parked a pickup a little bit further down from the ball field. From the should have been there, I guess. But Bill Waddington was flying this thing at the time. Came in because you could come in. I will get. Where's that map? Yeah, you. You could come in quite, quite level from this end here, and the ball field's right there. So he came in pretty low, I guess. All the people were set. But this pickup truck was parked there. But I guess perhaps somebody jigged what they should have jagged maybe half a second late. And they nailed this pickup truck. <laughs> and we found out about the bottom dumper. It's a little different than the side dumper. <laughs> the pickup truck didn't have a cabin anymore. <laughs> All the windows were blown out. <laughs> I'll tell you a bit more about that pickup late, later. <laughs> so, so, it went a little bit wrong. But anyways, we'll carry on. These, these are just some pictures of the facility after a few years. Yeah. Okay. That's about that's about enough for history. So I, I want to go on and, and tell you a little bit about what can go wrong with fires. Now, like I say, up until 1986. They dumped on 373 fires, and most of those fires went out, and everybody was happy, and we just forgot about it. But there was a couple that things didn't work out quite right. And for some reason, I happened to be there in a position of being some sort of a supervisor. And so, anyways, we'll start out was the first one. And I've got a map here. Maybe you can hold this up. Uh, this one? Yeah. yeah. Now, this map shows Scroat Lake here. There's Great Central Lake. There's the lagoon. The ball field was right there. This is Scroat Lake. Now, has anybody ever driven to Tofino? <laughs> okay, so you know that. Well, this was August the 17th, 1967. Okay? Now, at that time, like, this is the Tofino Highway as it is now. It goes up Taylor River. And you know when you're going to Tofino where you cross the bridge and there's a rest stop there? That's right there. But... In 1967, this road wasn't there. You had to go way up the mountain to the called the switchbacks and down the other side. It was a hell of a journey, and it was all potholes. It was god awful. <laughs> Anyways, this day, August the 17th, was hotter than hell. Logging camp had been already down two weeks. We were an extreme, and there was some guys working for BC Hydro. They were working right here, just before you get to Sutton Pass. You know where Sutton Pass is? Okay. These guys were working. They weren't supposed to be, but they were. And not only were they working, they decided they were putting in a pole, and they had to blast the hole. So they blasted the hole started a fire. It's a Saturday afternoon, one o'clock, started the fire. There was a fellow on patrol out here, a guy by the name of Bill Gray. He phoned Chauncey Jorgensen, the same guy. Chauncey phoned the Mars. The Mars is, base is right there. Called it out. Mars got there. By the time he got there, the fire was already 
close to two acres. Bill Waddington was flying to Mars. It was the LYL. He came in from this end, but there was no communication with anybody on the ground. Timbers tall, fire often is distorted. The smoke was going up through the timber, and he, the first the first drop he made, he basically missed the fire. So we went down, picked up another load, came back, 12, about 12 to 14 minutes after, by this time the fire was bigger, came back and he hit it right off, but the fire was just a bit too big, there was still a little bit left over on the bottom side. He went back for another load, but going back from the, for the third load, he lost an engine. Inside port side engine started burning up. And so they had to curtail. That was about 1.30 in the afternoon. Saturday afternoon. By Sunday night, the fire had encompassed everything that's red there. Now, nine years ago, I put this thing on at different places. One place was Gabriola. There's the size of Gabriola Island. 10,000 acres. That's what that fire burnt in 24 hours. It's a wake-up call. Gabriola Island, totally gone. Salt Spring Island, Sandwich Peninsula, <coughs> totally gone. So that is what can happen. So anyways, I know, I know exactly where that fire burned because on the second week of the fire, the guy was there the whole time. I was there right at the start and saw it. He's totally helpless. Second week of the fire, I got a job. The manager of the camp told me to go to the office, get a, a, a map. It was a 20 chain map, a huge map. He says, you go out with Bill Waddington in the morning while well, the fire's cool and the ghost fly around and round in circles and map the perimeter of the fire. So that's what I did for three days. I was still. <laughs> so so I'll, I'll show you. I want to catch up with my pictures here. <laughs> that pickup, that was my pickup. It was right in the middle of the of Taylor River. And we, one of the jobs, once we saw everything was lost, I got the job of dragging these old jarvis and putting them in the middle of the river as a D8. And then, but that pickup, that's the same pickup that the LYL squashed. They put a new cab on it, and when I got my first job on staff, they gave me that as my pickup. What a piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> so, that picture there, when that picture was taken, within half an hour after that picture was taken, it was all gone. It was all burnt. There was, there was a big bridge. Where's the, where's the map? I'll show you. 
There was a big bridge right here, and I was so proud of that bridge. When I was a student, I was involved in designing and building. It was a big blue lamb bridge, 120 foot span, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I was proud. So they said, you go down with the D8 and put a pump in the water, you've got to save the bridge. So did that, but pretty soon we picked up the pump, got in the pickup, drove away, and the bridge was gone. So, so uh, along with a lot of other things. Okay, so, so I, I think, so I, I was involved for the next four or five years logging timber that burnt on that fire. But at the same time, billions and billions of dollars were lost there. So, so we'll carry on. Uh, I just want to talk about one, one other uh, fire that I was involved with too. It was even more dramatic. So, and that's this one. So, where's this one? Here you are. So, this one was at North West Bay again. And this was 17 years or whatever later, 1978, anyways. And so just just stand to the side if you don't mind there, Doug, so people can see the map. There we go. Okay. You. So so you can see the Deuce Bay, the Dymo. Mount Moriarty is here. Englishman River. On this day, same sort of thing. Hotter than hell. One morning. There had been forecasts for lightning activity. By this time, I was the divisional manager of Northwest Bay Division, and our, our uh, headquarters were right here, just south of Parksville. They're still there. And Northwest Bay Division encompassed all the way from the Chimanus River, or, or all the way up to Cumberland on the east coast of Vancouver Island. There's a boat over 300,000 acres. And so I was the king of the castle. <laughs> On this particular morning, I had been called to head office at Nanaimo for a meeting. But we got word about this lightning thing, so I decided I'd better go back to camp. The crew was all off. They'd been off for a week now. Most of them were in Parksville Beach or <laughs> off camping somewhere or doing something. So I got back to camp. By that time, we had already got reports that at Souk there had been a couple of lightning strikes already. And by that time, FIFT had one helicopter, a Bell 206. It had been dispatched to Souk and to Port Renfrew. So we did that. So I called out the bird dog, the growing goose, put the Mars on standby and got it started up. We had eight different supervisors patrolling all out through the area with tankers and, and whatnot. And about that time, it started a torrential rain all along the coast. <coughs> and I thought to myself, well, that's a relief. but. No sooner than I thought that, we got a report from the goose that he was flying around out here and he discovered this fire in the back of Mount Moriarty. It was right at the bottom of a box canyon. Like there was cliffs 2,000 feet high all around it. There it is. That's the place where it started. You can see the cliffs around it. So anyways, I was the last one at the office besides we had 
like the girls and the accountants and that, they were calling out the crew already. I was the last one at the office for myself and an old foreman, Helgi Stephenson. We started out for the fire. We had to drive all the way down here and up, up there. Now that's a distance of about 18 miles. When we got to this point, there was a tanker, an old logging truck with a 3,500-gallon tank on it. There it is. That's the one. Old devil. And so Helgi dropped me off, and I picked up that old tanker, started grinding my way up the hills, long hill, because that's all we had. So I got up to the fire. I could remember breaking up about here the top of the hill, and then I could see the fire ahead of me, and I thought, oh my God. So, I could drive right up to the base of the fire. At the same time that I arrived there, the first firefighter arrived. And what he was, was a logging truck driver from Northwest Bay. He arrived in his old car behind me, he had his cut, cut off pants on and a tank top and flip flops. <laughs> and he was ready to fight fire. So I got on top of the tanker and threw the hose out and he went running off. And the, by this time the fire was already two acres and the flames were 50 feet in the air. And so I said, okay, where are we go. And about the same time Bill Waddington arrived above me in the LYL. And he was flying around and looking at things. And, and he says, you know, Doug, he says, I can't do anything. And I said, what do you mean you can't do anything? And he says, no, I can't do anything. Like, like, I can't get within a thousand feet in elevation. Above so I said, okay, well, what you better do is come in from the, from the southeast side. This is uh, Crown Zellerback land up. Come in from there, just over the cliffs, and drop her. And so I was standing on the top of the tank, looking up, and he dropped this load. With, and it had gel guard in it, so it was one big blob. <laughs> and it was coming down, and it came down, and it came down, and it came down. And I was watching and watching and watching. It was coming down. And, and it took a long time to get down there. But when it got to about 100 feet up above the fire, the flames were so high then, it went back up again. <laughs> And so, Bill, he flew around a couple times, and do you know what he said to me? He said, Doug, it was nice of being, service, being of service to you. <laughs> he flew around a couple times, and then he said, have a nice day. <laughs> and he left. Right just after that, the fire seemed to create its own draft. And this is something that I could only explain to you and you can't understand this until you experience it. Maybe some people at Lahaina experienced it or somebody at Jasper. But all of a sudden this thing created its own draft, the huge vortex, the flames right over us. I grabbed old Roy and he was on the running board of this truck. I backed started backing up. Any truck drivers here? Well, anyways, we were in reverse overdrive. <laughs> and you could back up one of those things at 15 miles an hour. And that's what we were doing. And the flames, it was actually spotting faster than we could back up. And so we backed up about a mile, but then we just stood and watched. That's all we could do. Bill came back later on in the day and flew around and he says we can't do anything like the wind shear is so great now that we can't even get near it. So I'll, I'll show you. That's what it's 
things look like. So, we spent the rest of the afternoon, we had all the crew there, we spent the rest of the afternoon watching. The thing went right over the mountain a couple of miles down the other side. And there's another picture I took of the Mars the day after. Here we are. On the other side, I had this beautiful new big slack line logger or yarder that I just bought. <laughs> this thing cost a billion and a half dollars in 1978. Like it was, this was state of the art. And it, and it had a beautiful new log loader with it. Well, <coughs> I went out there the next morning, but that's what she looked like. <laughs> Plus, you could look at the, you could see the Felden Buck behind. But once fire goes through Felden Buck, it's worthless. Billions and billions of dollars. Poof. So, so anyways, the next morning, I got to work three o'clock in the morning. At that time, we had 600 loggers there. All these crummies, like, and all these. There was loggers from every Macmillan Bloedel division on Southeast Vancouver, <coughs> right from Menzies Bay to Chimanus, all the Port Alberta divisions. Also, Crown Zeller back, all their logging people. BC Forest Products, Kayakus. We, they were all there. But so we had to organize this, all the contract, even, you know, the guys that bought, bought uh, the bars, Colson, Colson and Prescott were actually there, even. So they were all there. I got in the, we had the helicopter there by then, got in the helicopter and flew out to have a look at things. That's what I saw. So that wasn't too great. Got back, got the guys going. That morning, by that time, we had managed to locate seven helicopters. And one of those helicopters was flown by a guy that's sitting right there. Okay, Bruce Payne, stand up, Bruce. There he is, that's the guy. So, so at the time, Bruce was working for Vancouver Island helicopter and they had a brand new Bell Jump Long Ranger helicopter, state of the art, Allison engine, really good stuff. And so we started to use Bruce and what I decided along with Bill Waddington we decided looking at the situation here the things were pretty dicey in there. Like that valley was only maybe four or five square miles and it was smoke like that. And, remember, and we had seven helicopters, we had the two bars coming in there every 15 minutes. And on top of that, the BC Forest Service got involved and we had there, we had two DC-6s and three A-26s coming in as well. So it was a dog's breakfast. <laughs> And so we decided that Bruce was this, he would coordinate all the flights, all the drops. We didn't use the Grumman Goose as, as, a, as a bird dog. It was, and so, so that's what we did. This went on for 17 days. The fire, and we just put, played a, basically a holding action and we held her all day. Every, every afternoon the wind would come up and she'd take off. And depending on how smoky it was, we'd either pick up water right out from Georgia Street, salt water, or we'd pick up from Sprout Lake or, or Lake Couch. And one of the, the bars were coming in every 12 to 18 minutes. Bang, bang, bang. And, and like I said, there, there's what it looks like, what they were flying on. So that went on for, like I say, for 18 days. Now, I never saw published how many 
how many drops the Mars actually made on the Moriarty fire. But I do know on the Taylor River fire, the Mars made 286 drops. The Moriarty fire, I'm sure, was more than that. And it just went on and on until it rained on Labor Day weekend. So, so uh, I like I flew with with Bruce a good part of the time, and we were pulling around doing other things. But one of the things I want to mention about the Moriarty fire is on that fire, after the third day, as per the Forest Act, the way it was stated at that time, the Ministry of Forest was supposed to take over the management of the fire. And when that happened, things went a little bit to hell in a basket. <laughs> But uh, we won't talk too much about that, but, but uh, uh, one of the things that happened, we had all these 400 plus loggers working there. When they started on the fire, they were being paid IWA firefighting rates. And at that time, in 1978, it was about $8 an hour. As soon as the Forest Service take, took over, their rates were reduced to two dollars and ninety-five cents an hour. Now, you could imagine there was some very unhappy cappers around that place. And then there, there was also a lot of different ideas as to how the bar should be used and how it shouldn't be used. And uh, so it went on for a while, but. We ended up resolving the whole thing in the end. Well, the fire went out anyways. <laughs> and, uh, but that was the last major fire on the BC coast that loggers were used for fighting fire. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Since that time, the Forest Service has developed what they call their rapid attack groups. They have a the headquarters at Parksville and, and some in the interior. And they're doing a, a great job. I'm not knocking them. They're, they're doing a good job. But uh, so times have changed. We're talking about a long time ago. The, the one thing I wanted to say, and I forgot, to, right at the start of the Mars situation, or the, the Forest Service was one of the signatory members of Forest Industries Flying Tankers. But right off the bat, there was a, I guess you would say a disagreement on how the railroad should be run. <laughs> the Forest Service wanted the Mars to operate on their beck and call all over the province of BC. The forest industry members and the whole philosophy of the Mars was that it was to operate on a 200 mile radius around the base at Sprout Lake of Port Alberni. After that, it wasn't official. It's too slow. The Mars only flew at 160 knots. And the forest, the whole rationale of the forest industry was that the Mars was to be an, an initial attack tool. It was to get out there right away and blast the hell out of it. And with that in mind, any supervisor of a mem member company, any logging supervisor, had the authority to fold up, call the Mars out, and get it fighting fire. The Forest Service, they were, and for good reason, they were looking at protecting the public purse. In order to call aircraft out onto a fire, 
they had to have approval from very senior members in, in, in the Forest Service or political people. It's a different philosophy altogether. And both philosophies are good, but they're not compatible. <coughs> so, so anyways, and to this day, to my knowledge, the Ministry of Forests there, philosophy <coughs> is the same. In fact, I heard in, 19, in 2015, the Minister of Forests got on the media and said that the Forest Service only calls out aircraft after the ground crews cannot cope with the situation. The industry was the other way around. They just called the call out aircraft right away and hit the sucker. The Forest Service has a very good system for the interior of BC. What they have done, they're using land-based aircraft. Their airports all over the province are set up to accommodate these guys. They're using long-term Retardants. They started with bentonite, fire pro, floss check. These retards are used mainly as for laying fire guards, not hitting the fire right on. It's a different philosophy. And it's a good one. It's nothing wrong with it. But, uh, and it's good for the interior because there's much greater distances involved. The aircraft are much faster. But to take the bars and fly it, you know, political decision, they took it and flew it in 2015 to Nelson. By the time it was there, it was out of gas. They had no infrastructure to fuel the thing. It was crazy. But uh, we won't get on with that, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's about it. I, uh, there was a couple of other things I was going to say, but I can't remember what they are now. This, you can see those brown, that's long term retardants. This is the Mars crew in, about, in the early 90s. <coughs> Bruce is right there. Now, yeah, I just wanted to mention these things. We have lots of options looking looking to the future. This CL 415. I mentioned Nils Christensen. Well, Nils was the proprietor of Viking Air, but they were involved in developing a lot of these things. He was called the Goose Doctor. He, this is Colson. That's, that's uh, Hercules using Foscheck. Mars again. That's, these are just a couple of <coughs> paintings I did. This, this one I wanted to, I, I was on the bird dog and this fire was in 1970. Cameron Lake. I remember flying over there. We made, uh, we made, uh, what was it? Six drops with both both Mars on that fire. I remember the first time we flew across. Jack Waddington was flying the goose, and I was on the bird dog. When we went across in front of that fire, it was burning just like it was like hitting a brick wall. The, the, you know, the wind shear from that fire was just, it was just like hitting a brick wall. So that's, that's it. The, the, one, the one thing, just in closing, I, I wanted to mention, I put this program, more or less the same thing, on about eight times at Vancouver Island in 2015. Since that time, we've had Barrier, we've had Lytton, 
we've had Lahaina, and now we've had Jasper. So I think it's about time we start paying attention. Thank you.